Colossians chapter 1. We'll be looking at verses 15 through 20 this morning. In full transparency, I feel wildly unqualified to preach Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Um, there are, we, we believe that every text of Scripture is inspired by God, so it should be the same every week. <laughs> but this text is one of the highest texts of Christology in all of the New Testament. It beautifully displays the nature and the character and the work of Jesus Christ. It's one of the most beautiful texts about Him, and it's easy for us, I think, to take these texts for granted, um, perhaps because a great deal of history has passed since they were written, perhaps because we've been believers for a long time, and so they're old truths to us, perhaps because we talk so much about them that they become common, which in one sense is very beautiful, <laughs> and in another is very unfortunate, that a text like this would captivate our affections, that Christ would captivate our affections, and that we would say as a result with every breath, I long to follow Jesus. That's the application of a text like this. And we sing that partially because it is true, and partially by way of reminder <laughs> towards each other that this is how things ought to be. This would be that every breath would long to follow Jesus would be consistent application uh, in our life, like we looked at last week, that as we are filled with the knowledge of His will, it produces a life that is fitting, that matches with Jesus. So, it is my prayer this morning that this text would, would cause us to rejoice. It would cause us to, to humbly worship as we recognize the supreme and singular position of Christ above the creation and above the recreation. And it is our joy, it is our joyful place to be in Him. So let's seek His help this morning. Father, these are your words. Jesus is your word. And as we come to a text like this that sings the praises of the Son of God, I ask that you would give clarity to us, that there would be no misunderstanding, as there often has been, even from a text um, that seems so clear. Father, that my inability to communicate would be washed away with the splendor of Jesus. That as we read these words, the Spirit of God who indwells us would do His work. That He would be faithful to illuminate, to shine the light on the meaning of this text, and because He goes with us from this place, in us, the Spirit of Jesus Himself, that these truths would not be washed away, but that they would become centerpiece, the centerpiece of our lives if they are not already. We praise Your name and seek Your help in all this, in these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if we're to understand the purpose of Paul in this letter, then we must understand that the basis for all of the things that he's arguing, all of the things that he is teaching, is the truth about Jesus. It is the study of Christ. It is Christology that is at the heart of Paul's argument for the Colossians that Jesus is enough. If what we find in this text is not true, then we should heed the false teaching that was present in Colossians, and we should search elsewhere. 
We should look outside of Christ, supplement Him with all of these other little G gods that sound good, that sound as though they have something to offer, and we should build a portfolio, a religious portfolio, in order to assist us in spiritual maturity. But if this text is true, and it is, for it proceeds from the mouth of God, then we should gaze on the glory of Jesus and resolve to never look away. He is it. He is everything. Understanding what Paul says this morning, honestly, it's embarrassing that we would ever look elsewhere. And yet this is the call of Colossians 3, that we would constantly be setting our mind on things above where Christ is seated. So this passage, verses 15 through 20 particularly, it leaps out of the surrounding context as a distinct section. One of the distinctions being that the readers, the Colossians, are nowhere to be found in verses 15 through 20. They've been the object of his prayer, right? Even his thanksgiving that the gospel has worked in them, it's produced life in them, and and now it's producing fruit, and he prays for them that they would be filled with the knowledge of God. And then immediately after, in verses 21 through 23 that we'll look at next week, it's this reconciliation of the saints to the Father. They're very present in the letter. Not in this section. This section is exclusively about Jesus. In these verses, then, the language just lifts. <laughs> it ascends, it just lifts our chins to really look and take another gaze at Christ. Nothing else, anything, anywhere could assist God in His redemptive work by the means of Jesus Christ alone. The only person in view in the entirety of the text is the Father's beloved Son, mentioned at the end of verse 13. The King of Light. You remember that? The King of Light in whom we have redemption, verse 14, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And so as Paul writes what's often been identified as a hymn, not perhaps a hymn in the way that we understand them today, but certainly a piece of poetry that flows elegantly in its organized description of Jesus, then I would suggest to you this morning that the organization of the text will direct us toward its meaning. There are two verses in the poem. And in between, there's a brief interlude in between these two verses. And they are parallel verses. The interlude is essential as well. I think, in fact, that we'll find at the very end that it is the central point of the song. Of the song. Um, but these two main sections are parallel, but they're distinct in their emphasis. So I just want to show to you the way in which Paul organizes the letter. Because that will set us on the right path of understanding. So the things that are parallel. First... He begins both sections the same way with this, what is a a relative pronoun, normally translated who. That's why you find, uh, well, it's not in verse 15 in our translation, he is. But in verse 18b, you you would find who is the beginning. So in both, he's referencing Jesus, the one previously mentioned as the one that brought redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. That one, the second person of the triune God, he is, in the first section, the image of the invisible God, and then the second statement, the firstborn of all creation. Parallel to that, in verse 2, you might say, he is the beginning. And then he uses firstborn to to, uh, supply again. He says, the firstborn from the dead. So those are the two parallel statements that he is making, the arguments that he is making. Then he supplies those arguments with evidence. For in Jesus all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created through him and for him. That is the evidence of the truth 
of the statement made in verse 1. I'm using verse relating to the hymn, not to our verse numbers. Secondly, he's the beginning, firstborn of the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For, here's evidence, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile all things for himself. And so he provides evidence for the statement that Jesus is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. Paul uses the same three prepositions in the same order in both of these defenses. So that is the in him, through him, for him. In him, through him, and for him. And we'll, dis- we'll discuss that, I suppose, when, when we arrive at that point in the text. Finally, Paul continues to emphasize, generally speaking, the fullness that is supplied in Jesus by using the word all eight times in this text. Three times in verse one, three times in verse two, and then twice in the center. Now, what's the point of the center here? Between these two, we find an important interlude, transition, you might say. It has three lines, and all of them start with the same word, and. The first and third both make supreme statements about Jesus. He himself is before all things. He himself is the head of the body, the church. And what they do is this first one points upward toward the previous section, and the second one points downward toward the section that follows. And here in the center, we find the point not only of the middle, but I think the point of the song, that it is in Jesus, all things consist, all things continue, all things are made full in him. So verse one concerns creation, Jesus's relationship to creation, right? He himself is before all things here. And verse two is recreation, or redemption, reconciliation. That is the creation of the new man, the creation of his body, the creation of his people. So verse one is about creation. Verse two is about the church and redemption. And in the middle, we find that Jesus' sustaining work relates to both of those realities. So, Christ, supreme in creation. Let's begin working through this first section. He is the image of the invisible God. We probably say this too much, but this could be a sermon by itself, that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Many points in this text could be sermons of themselves. We will be fortunate if we're not blasting through the end of this by the end of this morning. But an image, what is that? An image or an icon, it is something that looks like or represents something else. A penny has the image of Abraham Lincoln stamped into it. Idols are images of theoretical gods. A picture of me is an image, a visible representation of me. Now, one of the issues with all of these legitimate examples and usages of image is that the image is less valuable than the object. And that is not always the case, or that is not necessitated by the use of the word. Paul goes to great lengths in this Christ song to establish the value, even the full divinity of Jesus. But he is, what he's saying, so the emphasis of this text, the image of the invisible God, and another time this is used in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, if you'd like to look at that, is that Jesus, as the image or the visible representation of God, reveals God, shows God. After all, doesn't the scripture say, no one has seen God? John 1.18, as Paul says here, God is invisible. The human eye does not naturally capture his image. 
A major question then in ancient and present thought, Jewish, Greek, and Western, where can God be seen? Where do I see God? It's one of the reasons that people throughout Scripture even have so often said, show us a sign. Show us a sign. We want evidence. We want to be able to see Him. And this is the reason also that the God's covenant people so often treasured the moments where the presence of God was visible with them. That is near and dear to us because we tend to love that which we can see. But now, God, the invisible God, is made visible. This is the miracle of the incarnation extended. Jesus is the visible God, Emmanuel, God with us. As John said, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, we saw his glory. As Hebrews proclaims in verse 3 of chapter 1, the Son is the brightness of God's glory and the exact image of God's person. So he is the precise, full, visible representation of God. His parallel argument with, with verse, oh, with, uh, in verse 1 is that Jesus is also not only the visible representation of God, that he is the firstborn over all creation. The second depiction of Jesus is perhaps a little more unique than even the first. The term firstborn has two meanings. The first is a very literal one that we would use today all the time, the firstborn, the oldest kid, the one that came before all the others. And the primary point that we're saying when we say firstborn is first in time, right? He preceded in time the other kids. It's one of the very common meanings. It's used all the time, even throughout Scripture. The second is less common, but used consistently, that this firstborn is someone who has the rank that is associated with the firstborn, even though they may not themselves have been born in time first. As an example of this, Psalm 89, 25, the Septuagint uses the same word, prototakos, and it says, I will make David firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. So David, as we know, in history with his brothers, he's not the firstborn brother. So we know that it's not referencing time. It's referencing his status, his inheritance, his rank, you might say, in relationship to this title, firstborn. So which is present when he says, when Paul says, he's making the argument, the firstborn over all creation Is he saying that Jesus is the first and the greatest creation? Or is he saying that Jesus has, he possesses the special rank of firstborn over the creation? Now, instinctually, we know which one it is. It's very clearly the second one. It must speak to his preeminence over something rather than that he was the firstborn of creation. But not all theologians have chosen that well. And just in case, this, uh, I want to do a little church history this morning, because this verse, the prototokos, the firstborn of creation, in parallel with John chapter 1 that we looked at previously, this was the source of one of, if not the greatest arguments in early church history. So some of the fathers in the first, second, and third centuries had laid the groundwork for this misunderstanding. But it was a man named Arius in the fourth century. This is the early 300s. He lived in Alexandria, and he began teaching that Jesus, the Word made flesh, 
was the first and greatest of God's creations. His intention was good, I think, and was seeking to be fair to the text. After all, grammatically, it could be either. He was seeking to reserve the Father's transcendence, the Father's otherness. And he believed that if Jesus was eternal God, then his obedience is like cheating. His obedience when he comes to earth is like, well, yeah, he obeyed. What does that mean? He's God. He needed to be created, the, the, the obedient one, the obedient creation of God in order to lead the way for us. Now, as you can imagine, even in Alexandria, one of his superiors, uh, Alexander, that's confusing, Alexander refuted him, and they fought, and the, the, it was a local controversy initially, but because they kept going back and forth at each other, and Alexander eventually uh, kicked Arius out. He says, you're a heretic. You're no longer allowed to be here. And then Arius went to the political leaders and things escalated from there. This is immediately following Constantine and, and this now theology becoming political. And if you want to win a theological war, maybe go talk to the emperor instead of the pastor because he may issue an edict and command everyone to believe and establish that this is not only religious, this is political truth. And so what happened is, as things escalated, Constantine called a council. He called a council of pastors from the Eastern and Western church. All together, this had not happened before in this way. And they gathered, and this was one of the main topics for them to discuss. Now, Arius wasn't allowed to be there because he had been kicked out by Alexander. But another person represented him. And what happened was, in this council, when Arius' view was presented, when the, when the idea that Jesus was the firstborn of the creation of God, that he was the first and greatest creation of God, as soon as he said that, all the people that didn't care about the controversy prior to immediately cared. And they all jumped in and as history tells us, they ripped up his notes, shredded them, stomped on them, and started crying out, heretic, liar, blasphemer. You cannot say those things. And the council unanimously, almost with the exception of that guy, maybe one or two others, they all gathered and they wrote what is the Nicene Creed. And I'd like to read it for you because it is an early, like, a few hundred years after this was written, it's a defense that Jesus possesses the special rank associated with the firstborn because he's God, not because he's the first and best creation. And so they said, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, that is from the substance of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, through whom all things were made, both in heaven and on earth, who for us humans and for our salvation descended and became incarnate, becoming human, suffered and rose again on the third day, ascended to the heavens and will come to judge the living and the dead and in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you can tell the, the object, their goal was to describe Christ in his fullness. And then they added an, a, like a, a piece after and they said, but to those that say, there was when he was not. That anything existed prior to him. To those that say, before being begotten, he was not. Or that he came from that which is not. Or that the Son of God is of a different substance or essence 
or that he is created or mutable, these, the Catholic Church, anathematizes. The universal church says, no, that's not a true and proper understanding of our God. You can see that their clear intention was to establish an early statement that rejected any notion that the Son or the Word, the Logos of God, was a creature or any being less divine than the Father. We spoke last week or two weeks ago of the universal nature of the gospel, that it goes into all the world, and contrasted that with the local heresies, these pop-ups, remember, that come up all throughout time. So Arianism was a pop-up, but it's popped up again and again and again, and we live amidst one of them. One of the reasons to describe this, or wanted to give that background, is that the LDS faith has promoted a Jesus that is the firstborn of Heavenly Father and one of his wives. And from, this is their own writing uh, from 1916, an authoritative document, it's called The Father and the Son. It says, he is essentially greater than any or all, or all others by reason of his, of his seniority as the oldest or firstborn of his unique status in the flesh as the offspring of a mortal mother and of an immortal or resurrected and glorified father, of his selection and foreordination as the one and only redeemer and savior of the race and of his transcendent sinlessness. In an article by an LDS prof at BYU, he said, Mormonism is a theological free agent Arianism and Mormonism share in the effort to maintain both a form of dependence and the unique status of the Son in relationship to the rest of creation. He's arguing that his faith has the ability to find connection, to find resonance in new and unexpected places, including early Christian heresies. What John 1 and Colossians 1 teach absolutely abolishes the idea that Jesus is a created being. What is the evidence for that? Because in Jesus, all things were made. And if he was made, (laughs) then how could that be? How could he have made himself as a created being if he made all things? All things were created, and then he describes uh, three sets of words that qualify the complete scope of creation that's in view. You think I'm not speaking of that he made all things. Well, everything that is in heaven and everything that is in earth, everything that is visible and everything that is invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities or powers. So the first pair, heaven and earth, a single whole, the created order, that which above is above and that which is below. Whether your eyes, this second pair, are able to capture it or not capture it. And that could be speaking in, uh, you know, seen and unseen or even in micro and macro. There's many things that we don't catch even that have been created um, by God that he made. And particularly, probably this physical and spiritual. The fact that we have realms that we can see and there are realms that we cannot see. All of it was made by him. And then surprisingly, the set of four thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, these all represent positions of authority. Now, why does he include positions of authority in that which he made? Because he's the supreme authority. Primarily, these four thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. We won't go into the details of each of those four words, but they primarily refer to the evil spiritual beings that rule in this present age. That is the primary punch of the words. True to the context of Colossians, true to the context of Ephesians, 
chapter six that uses many of the same words, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. These demonic forces that hold sway. Why would it be important to clarify that God has made even the evil authorities? Because he has power over them. Again, as Jesus said to Pilate, you would have no authority were it not given to you by my Father. So he made all of these things. But importantly, because of the the scope that he's trying to paint here, it's more than just evil powers. It's the good ones too. Good angels and bad angels. How about human authorities? How about the president and the governor and the teachers and all of these? Did he make all of them? Absolutely. The good ones and the bad ones. Every authority that has existed ever, anywhere, he made. Because all authority flows from Christ. All things were created through him and for him. The entirety of everything was made by him, including anything that has a shred of power. He is the source. It came from him. Now, before we move to the second one, these three prepositional phrases are really important. In him and then through him and for him. So many translations will also have by. In fact, for by him, that would be Uh, even the New King James that we read from. So for by him all things were created. And that's primarily communicating instrument, right? That it was by the instrument of Christ that he was created, or that all things were created. But when you use all three together, and you use all three together in um, in both arguments, the in him, I believe, references not that he is the instrument, but that he is the sphere, the domain, the location in which these things occurred. Two arguments in favor of that. The second preposition is a preposition of instrument. It says through him. <laughs> there, he is, there he is the active agent in the creation. So it would be, I believe, redundant unnecessarily uh, to use it that way. And secondly, because of the way that Paul is using these in a mirrored sense, if you look at the second, arg- uh, so the second argument, for all in the middle, for all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. I think he's probably using it the same way both times because they're parallel. So that would be all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell by him. And instrument there doesn't really resonate. It doesn't ring true. And so sphere, what does sphere mean? That all things were created in Christ. It's a little bit abstract, isn't it? Even our union with Christ, that I am in him. To describe that is a little bit difficult. Perhaps that's okay. (laughs) Perhaps um, we're seeking a specificity that Paul doesn't intend. Or that he intends it by means of understanding the other two prepositions. What does it mean that everything was created in terms of or in reference to Jesus? Well, all things were made through him. So he's the agent, the instrument. That is, he is at the beginning of them. There is nothing that was before him. Okay, so he's the instrument. And secondly, that they were created for him. So toward toward his advantage. He is not only the beginning, but he is the end of creation. It works toward him as the goal. So Christ, what what he's trying to communicate in these things is that Christ's relationship to the created world is comprehensive. It flowed out of him and it flows toward him. It originated in him And it culminates in him. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. So that is his first argument, is that Jesus is the visible representation of God, 
as the supreme uh, in rank above creation. And the visible evidence for that is the fact that everything was made in reference to him as the agent and the goal of creation. Let's skip the middle portion and go to the end. Here he says, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things for him. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That Jesus is the beginning. Greek word is arche. Fascinatingly and unsurprisingly, this is another word that speaks of both time and rank. (laughs) The same thing that prototakos can do, arche does as well. He is the first the beginning in time and rank. So as far back in time as you can go, Christ goes further. As high up in rank as you can go, Christ goes higher. He is the beginning, the first and the best. So these words would be used in like a Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, Septuagint would translate that in the arche, back, at, back way before. So there's our time reference. But it's also used throughout the Old Testament Again, Septuagint to say something like uh, the first among many, like the chief cupbearer. There are these other servants, but the chief one, uh, the highest one in rank is this guy. And so he's, I believe, communicating both here. One essential implication of the word, particularly when paired with firstborn immediately after, is that Christ is the founder, the first and best in the group of people who are going to rise from the dead is going to be his argument. So remember, we've moved, we skipped the transition, so we've moved from creation now to the re-creation. Firstborn from the dead. So let's reconsider here time and status. Is this speaking of Jesus' literal, that in time he was the first one to rise, or that in status, he was the highest one to rise. Now, I believe we're unrestrained theologically here. Neither one of these is going to put you in a dangerous theological position because Jesus being the first to rise in time, you say, well, what about, you know, Lazarus or Lazarus or some of these other uh, people that maybe even Jesus raised from the dead or that the prophets had raised? Well, what were they raised to? They were raised from death toward another death. They were raised to die again. But Jesus was not raised to die again. Jesus was raised uniquely. He was, and he was the first one to experience, to move toward, to establish this resurrection to life, this resurrection to being done with death, toward conquering death. There's none other before him that did that. So he is the first and the best. And the idea then is that we have this like um, captain, someone who is leading us through death because he was the firstborn from the grave. He sprang from the tomb toward eternal life. Our hope is completely wrapped up in that idea as 1 Corinthians 15 would argue, if he hasn't done this, if he was not the firstborn from the dead, what are we doing here? Why are we sitting here? We serve a dead Jesus, and he's irrelevant. But if he rose, then all of our hope is wrapped up in him. So this resurrection demands universal preeminence. The sting of death is gone. That in all things, he may have preeminence, this first place. That he would be evaluated completely separately from anything or anyone else. Why? Well, as we've established before, because he is of the same substance of the Father. He is God himself. In all things, he may have the first place. As we sing, none above him, none before him. 
what is his defense of this second statement? How do we know that Jesus is before in time and above in rank, that he rose from the dead and that he leads us, his chosen band, to follow him through death? Because, for, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. Now, if we read from New King James, we'll say, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. So what's going on grammatically here? At first glance, the Greek sentence doesn't have a subject. The, the, the words that are present are that, in order that, in him was pleased all the fullness to dwell. Right? Those are the pieces of the puzzle <laughs> you kinda, that we have to work with. So the question is, what is the subject of was pleased to dwell? And uh, many translations do, so they would supply God, or even in ours, specifically the Father, that the Father was pleased. So we might have something like, God resolved that all the fullness should dwell in him. Right, God is the subject. Or it was the good pleasure of God that in him should all the fullness dwell. But upon a second and third glance, I think what would be, I think, easy to establish is that all the fullness is intended to be a personal subject. And there's a few arguments in favor of that. One is that when we don't, when the text has something present that can be the subject, better to let that be the subject than to supply one. Secondly, if you look in chapter 2, verse 9, we'll see this very similar idea here. It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So that the fullness of refers to the fullness of the Trinity, the triune God, the fullness of the Godhead is present in the book of Colossians. And that he's intending a personal subject is indicated because this fullness is uh, pleased to dwell and to reconcile. So it is an active thing. It is an active agent. The subject is doing something. So I believe what he's saying there is, is... to say it the way we've put it on the screen, that for all of the fullness of God, God himself, the triune being, saw it a good thing, chose in divine wisdom and will that, the fullness, that his fullness would live, would abide, would be visibly present in once again, the sphere in relationship to Jesus. He is full God of full gods. All the fullness was pleased to dwell in Christ. No part accepted. Why Would God do that? Why would God make himself visible by taking on human flesh, incarnating God fully? To reconcile. To reconcile what? (laughs) Everything. All things to himself. And that seems a little broad, (laughs) doesn't it? All things, not just his, his people. No, all things he's reconciling. The entire created realm will be reconciled to God. You see, it's his. Everything that he described in the first verse is his. He has a claim to it. So he doesn't just give it up. He doesn't hand it over. 
He's unwilling to give the key to death and hell to Satan. He's not willing to do that. This is his. And neither is he, and as I think is a beautiful argument in favor of the renewal of this earth rather than its annihilation and the recreation of a new one. We have this argument that Jesus is going to recapture. He's going to reconcile, in Ecclesiastes language, this bone that he broke, namely our world, this world that he cursed, can only be reset by him. And he's going to do it. Reconciliation brings to us this idea, and we'll talk at length about this next week. Next week, we'll we'll sort of begin from this point right here and work through then personal reconciliation that he, that he encourages in 21 through 23. This idea of reconciliation necessarily means that something's been broken. It means that the relationship is shattered. The need's restored. And that's only possible if full God dwells in full man in order to sacrifice himself for his broken creation. That's the only way that it works. You remove any piece of that puzzle and the puzzle falls apart. So the scope of his restoration, the scope of his recreating is universal. How is he going to do that? How did he do that? Oh, time. I'll just make this statement. It's not, a, it's not universal from the universalist perspective that everyone will be brought together. So I, I believe, in short, what he's arguing is, is that he will bring peace to everything. That's him resetting the bone. And that will, as is present very obviously next week, mean that in some, there's restoration of relationship if indeed you continue in the faith, <laughs> right? But it doesn't necessitate that all, that there's re- restored relationship with all, but he brings peace. So there's renewal, refreshment, or passivity, pacifism. It's done, the war is over. How does he do that? Well, he did it by making peace through the blood of his cross. This is the means of reconciliation. Peace through bloodshed the highest price, the blood of the author, sustainer, and redeemer of the creation. It was the only way, and I think that only goes to further fortify the idea that God values this world in that he shed his physical blood for the restoration of all things, the reconciliation of all things. And so he sacrificed himself this Jesus, this image of the invisible God, this firstborn over all creation, this beginning, this firstborn from the dead died. He bled. That we would be able to follow him in resurrection from death. Why did he do that? I would just remind you of the same three prepositions. All of this occurred in the sphere or with relationship to Christ. And he was, he did it through him, through him to reconcile. So he's the active agent in recreation to reconcile all things for himself. So he did it with himself as the goal, with his glory as the goal, with his satisfaction, with his smile as the goal. Now, the middle section briefly What it does is it brings these two ideas together, creation in the first line, recreation in the third line. We've established God as active agent, the one doing it. Jesus is active agent. We've also established that he is the goal, the end of it, the beginning and the end. So the question is, what about now? What about right now? If he is the beginning and the end, how is he interacting today with this creation? And we think of this in terms of, Uh, very often of the first creation, the original creation, right? He himself, he's before all things. There, that word again, it, it communicates both time and rank. He is before all things. And in him, there it is again, in the sphere of Christ, everything 
consists. Christ is the sustainer of all of the created world. The universe owes its continuing coherence to Jesus. What holds the universe together is not an idea or a virtue, but a person, the resurrected Christ. And he's stating that all things hold together not only through a divinity, which might be more globally accepted, right? Sure, a deity holds all this together, and that's a personal or impersonal. We're not so sure. We don't know who he is. But to say that Paul is saying that Jesus, the one you just killed, that man is God, and he holds it all together. That's exclusive and certainly shocking. That is the message of this gospel. That divinity, he recently walked earth as a human, That's part of what makes the incarnation so remarkable. Without Jesus, electrons no longer continue to circle nuclei, right? Without Jesus, gravity ceases to work. Without Jesus, the planets wouldn't stay in their orbits. Without him, it all falls apart. This whole created world is a complete mess without him. But it's not just the created world that's a mess without him. Because what Paul is doing is he's saying, you know this creation and how God works in it? He works the same way in the new creation. He's the beginning of it. He's the head of it. The head of his body. He uses this metaphor, the head of the body. We are the body, not just locally us, but but the universal church is his body. He made it. He's the agent of it. And... He's the goal of it. He's the end of it. And what is he doing now? He's sustaining it. And if it is true that Jesus, the second person of the triune God, is the only sustaining agent in our life as new creatures, where else can we go? He has everything. To stray from him is to stray into disorder and chaos. So, briefly, application. What do we do with this text? Firstly, from a theological perspective, what Paul is doing is he's securely fastening our rescue. Remember what God has done? He's qualified and rescued us, delivered us. He's linking that with supreme power to make it immovable, unshakable, Nothing can take away our rescue. And he's connecting that supreme power, the person of Jesus, to the authority of the Father. So he's marrying together Christ and the Father and their divine authority. He is God. He and the Father are one. They and the Spirit exist together in eternity past as God. So if Jesus is the agent and goal of creation of this physical world, point one, then what do we do? I think... We uphold his principles, we uphold his values in that, for even secondary applications, that he will, that will champion life, (laughs) that we will, will champion the value of life from conception to natural death. It's from him, it's his. It's not ours to do with it what we want. We will stand against the lie of, of macro evolution, right, as our origin story. No, it's not. We were made by Jesus himself. And he placed us with value in the very image that he is. He made us in. We represent God on this earth. And so we will uphold those things. If he's the present sustainer, then everything that we have physically and spiritually, creation, recreation, is a gift. The life in our lungs, the measure of health in our bodies, the warmth of family and friends, the continued supply of water and food, the degree of environmental flourishing that we possess, all those physical gifts, all of it is held together by him and for you, for him. He does it for himself. And these spiritual blessings that we've received in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that we have been redeemed and adopted and that he's with us in his spirit. We have this comforter that, uh, I mean, the list just goes on and on. All of these things exist in Christ for you. That he is the head of the church. We will hear and follow this word made flesh. His voice will command authority in our family. 
We will not fear or follow any power contrary to his own. We'll joyfully submit our lives to him as our king. That he is the firstborn of the dead, we have no fear in death. He already faced it on our behalf, and he will lead us safely through it. You're not the first in the group to jump. He already did. And so he leads us into eternal life. That he is the reconciler of all things. Rejoice in what is and anticipate what is to come. The story is not over yet. Because he has, uh, because he has made this world even that we enjoy so much, even through its brokenness, will he not renew the land and sky wonderfully? Will he not make this new earth a beautiful place for us eternally? We can rest in that. We can look forward to that. It's not just harps on the clouds, right? It's a new earth where we rejoice forever with him. So in all of these things, Jesus Christ, the Son, is supreme. Eternal in time and first in rank. The agent, sustainer, and object of the original creation and the recreation. Truly, we need nothing else. Let's pray.